Let me welcome you to the first uh, green bag presentation of this uh, academic year for the Wallace Stegner Center uh, here at the uh, S.J. Quinney College of Law. Uh, I'm Bob Keiter. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I've had the privilege of directing the uh, Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment for the last 20 some odd years. I won't even begin to try to uh, count the number. Um, and uh, we're very pleased to have you with us today, uh, and we're also very pleased to be able to present uh, this panel discussion uh, on uh, the Mountain Accord uh, process that we're in the midst of uh, here on, along the Wasatch Front. Uh, before I introduce our panelists uh, and uh, the program, let me make a couple of uh, just quick announcements. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are lawyers uh, and uh, interested in CLE credit, the sign-up sheet is over here. Uh, on this table. You can uh, sign up on your way out if you haven't done so already. Uh, secondly, I understand from talking to a few people in the hallway that uh, for some reason uh, we have uh, apparently dropped uh, some of you from our email list uh, that announces upcoming Stegner Center events. Uh, or if you're not already on our list, uh, please uh, uh, add yourself if you would like, and I'll pass around this sheet to sign up with an email address so that uh, you get uh, announcements of programs. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, before starting the program, I just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, upcoming uh, events uh, that the Stegner Center, uh, in conjunction with the Natural Resource Law Forum here at the uh, law school, will be uh, presenting. Uh, we have another green bag presentation in approximately uh, uh, two weeks. Um, and that's on December 3rd uh, when uh, Cullen Battle, uh, who is an attorney with the Fabian uh, Clendenin Law Firm downtown, uh, will be talking about uh, his uh, litigation over Utah Stream uh, access. And uh, if I read uh, the news uh, reports recently, he had a victory in the local district court, and I'm sure he'll be talking about uh, this question of uh, access to uh, streams for purposes of fishing and recreation, et cetera. So that's uh, December 9th. Um, at the end of January, as part of the Stegner Center's lecture series, we'll be hosting Krista uh, Schuyler, uh, who's a conservation photographer and writer. Uh, the topic of her presentation is Continental Divide, uh, Wildlife People, and the Border Wall. She has done work for National Geographic and other publications on the impact of the border wall in uh, the Southwest on uh, wildlife and movement back and forth between uh, the United States and uh, Mexico. And finally, I just wanted to note uh, March 30th, uh, the Wallace Stegner Lecture that precedes uh, our 21st annual symposium. The symposium uh, running uh, Thursday and Friday, the 31st and 1st of April, is on green infrastructure, resilient cities, new challenges, new solutions. Um, 
I should also note that our uh, uh, Stegner lecture will be given by uh, Larry Suskind, who's a city planner, uh, mediator, and a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, and quite a guru in the area of uh, uh, collaborative uh, processes, which is something we'll be hearing about uh, now regarding uh, the Mountain Accord, uh, which uh, is a uh, collaborative effort to preserve the central Wasatch and to ensure its long-term uh, vitality. We have with us today uh, the pro program manager for Mountain Accord, uh, Laney Jones, uh, on uh, my far left side uh, here. Uh, Laney uh, has had 20 years of experience uh, in environmental and NEPA uh, planning, transportation, and water quality uh, issues. She has a BS in civil engineering from Texas A&M and moved to the mountains where she has remained uh, since uh, 1997. And she's been overseeing this process, and I think she's going to lead off. Before you do that, let me introduce our other panelists uh, next to her, uh, Nathan Rafferty, uh, who is president of Ski Utah. Uh, he's also chair of the Utah Tourism Industry Association and vice chair of the Utah Office of Tourism Board of Directors. Uh, he's been with uh, Ski Utah, I believe, since 1994 uh, in various capacities, uh, most recently, obviously, as uh, president uh, of uh, Ski Utah. He graduated from the University of Arizona in 1994 uh, and uh, came up here immediately uh, and has also been named one of Utah's most influential people, 100 most influential people, by the Utah Business uh, Magazine. Uh, and finally, to my immediate left, uh, Carl Fisher, uh, who is uh, the executive director of Save Our Canyons, an organization that he's been with since his time uh, in, uh, as a college student here at the University of Utah. He graduated in 2005 with a degree in geography and environmental studies. Uh, he started full-time on the staff of uh, Save Our Canyons in 2006 uh, and uh, has been executive director for the last uh, several years. Uh, they provide a diverse uh, set of perspectives on uh, this process, uh, and uh, they've worked out a, a program for us, and I think, Laney, you're going to lead off and give us some background and to understand the Mountain Accord process. Uh, thank you for joining us. Let's thank our speakers for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us today. Uh, we hope to have a really engaging hour. So the format is that I'm just going to give a brief overview of the program, and we're going to hear from uh, Carl Fisher and Nathan Rafferty about what their experience was over the past two years, why they're still sitting at the table. Um, there's a lot of details uh, to the accord. There's big concepts and a lot of details. I'm going to let some of the details unfold through your questions. So I'm going to give high level, and we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions and go over the details. So just to start off, raise your hand if in an elevator you could give the elevator speech of what the accord is. Hang on, you don't get to read that. Raise your hand if you could give the elevator speech. Okay, not very many. Well, here's the elevator speech, okay? We are a voluntary group of individuals that have come to, and agencies that have come together to really settle the future of the Central Wasatch Mountains. It's focused on preserving what we love about the mountains and resolving some of the conflicts that have been going on for decades. So we brought everybody to the table in kind of an unprecedented way to come to a willing agreement on how we want to uh, manage the increasing use in the mountains. So far, our before the Mountain Accord came along, we made a lot of decisions in a piecemeal fashion in the mountains. So we kind of battled it out half acre by half acre in the headlines and the courts. No offense to any of the attorneys in the room. Uh, but we are here to make meaningful compromise and um, about the future. So it's a historic commitment. We did come to an actual compact in August, and we've had hundreds of signatories, including the governor of the state of Utah. 
And the, uh, the accord just represents a moment where we're all pointed in, in the same direction. What's in the accord has some high level principles and concepts that we agree to, and then also has some very specific actions. Uh, they're centered around our uh, environment and recreation activities that we love, our transportation systems. Uh, and economic health and vitality. And depending on what the action is that we're talking about, some of those actions are uh, in the very concept stage and some of them are a little more um, cooked, as you will. So, uh, so first of all, why is Mountain Accord needed? So we've been, we've been at this for about two years. And when we started, we had to really take a hard look at why is it so important that we uh, address the preservation of the mountains. So as you know, so over half a million people that rely on the water that come out of the mountains. And it's not only on the Salt Lake City side, but on the Park City side as well. They get their drinking water from the mountains. So what's happening is that we see a lot of use. In the, uh, in the area between Salt Lake and Park City and I-80 and Little Cottonwood, which is our study area, we see almost six million visitors a day. I mean, oh yeah, a day, right, a year. Six million visitors a year. Um, and so that is, if you look at all five national parks in the state of Utah, that's about that visitation. Who would have thought that we have that much visitation? Uh, on a peak day, which currently right now is happening in the winter most of the time, we have 50,000 people that go into that tiny little area and then they leave. Now, what we're seeing is that we have more and more of those peak days. And now we're starting to see those peak days happen in the summer. Who went up to Oktoberfest this summer? Anybody? A lot of people. So we signed the accord uh, on August 3rd. And we had a consensus from our entire executive board, 23 members, that represents a really diverse array of government entities, all the way from uh, local elected officials to state government to federal government, uh, as well as what's unusual about the accord is that we actually invited private entities to participate and have a vote <laughs> on the executive board. And so they are willingly participating. We have two of those private entities with us today that you're gonna hear from. So that's a, a, a copy of the, the first page of all of our executive board members and their, uh, the signatures. We did actually secure all the signatures of the entire executive board and you can actually sign the accord on the website as well. We've had hundreds of members of the public. Um, so what we're, what we're gonna do uh, today is we're gonna talk about what's in the accord, what your questions are, and what we're gonna be doing moving forward. So um, the accord focused on, first of all, preservation of the environmental resources and the watershed. And so what's proposed is that there are actually additional federal protections and the land exchanges that ensure that all of our upper ridge lines and the beautiful areas that we enjoy are around for future generations. The ski resorts have really stepped up in offering a lot of the land that they own outside the ski resorts that we recreate on, myself included, and you don't even know you're on private land. So they stepped up to put that into preservation and in exchange we're concentrating development and land ownership at the base of the resorts. That's a, a major concept in the Accord as well as a concept that we wanna really focus our development in the urban area in the, in the future and preserve the mountains. We'd like to connect our urban areas and mountains with mass transit so that uh, you have multiple ways to get there instead of just using your private automobile. So uh, in the next phase, we'll be focused on making those key transportation decisions. Whatever we do will have, um, certainly is gonna have economic impacts. And so we are looking to um, do some work around the economies of what we're, what we're proposing. So I think that's a great introduction. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carl. And um, we're going to hear from Carl. And after that, we'll turn it over and hear from Nathan. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having us. And look forward to your questions. I do think as Mountain Accord is really based in public in input, um, I think that's going to be the way we're going to get the best out of, out of this forum. Um, Save Our Canyons has been working for over 40 years to try and protect the central Wasatch Range, water quality, recreation access, uh, wildlife habitat, 
there's a number of things that are extremely important to many of us, many of us in this room, many of us in this community, many people in the world about this central Wasatch Mountains. Uh, they're an international destination. Um, our population is continuing to spike, as Laney, as Laney mentioned, and that's exerting uh, extreme pressures on this very finite and limited resource. And as time has gone on, we've watched a lot of these things, and our organization has been involved in many of the decisions and the policy, uh, uh, the policy framework that governs the central Wasatch Mountains, and it's been changing as our communities changes. So how do we adapt and how do we respond to that change from, from a policy perspective is a lot of what we got involved in the Mountain Accord for. So going back to 1999, we partnered with Salt Lake City uh, Public Utilities and, and kicked off the idea of expanding wilderness areas in the central Wasatch Mountains to protect our water, watershed. It's one of the tools in the toolbox to achieve conservation um, of, of this place. As you probably know, there's also, and as Laney's mentioned, there's, there's, public, or there's private lands up there in addition to the public lands, right? The ski resorts operate on a private-public kind of partnership that allows them to run their ski areas. There are a number of private parcels up in the, in the canyons. Um, development has impacts for certain on not only wildlife and the, and the habitat up there, but also our water quality. So what kinds of checks and balances are we putting in place to help preserve our water supply. And we've tried to do a number of these things. Um, we worked as an organization in the uh, 80s to implement Salt Lake County's Foothills and Canyons Overlay Zone. Um, since, since that time, the legislature has changed the, the, the laws that um, really made the FCAS ordinance uh, work. And I would say since about the mid-2000s when the legislature took away conditional uses and, and made them de facto permitted uses, it kind of turned the, uh, con the permitting process and, and the FCAS ordinance, it, it just turned it into complete and utter chaos. Yet we've not been able to achieve corrections to, to those state laws that that permit what types of development is appropriate, is not appropriate, and really mutes the public voice um, in participating in public processes and land use decisions that affect the um, central Wasatch Mountains. Uh, so by about 2008, go back to the wilderness um, proposal, we worked in a collaborative process, kind of like this Mountain Accord, albeit a little bit smaller uh, group of people, the ski resorts, Wasatch Powderbird Guides, Salt Lake County, Salt Lake City, um, ourselves, Black Diamond, I think also uh, it was, was engaged in that effort. But over the course of two and a half years, crafted legislation, introduced it to Congress, um, got a hearing before Congress, and the bill basically never went anywhere, though we continually reintroduced it uh, for decade, or year after year. It was introduced three times. Never, never really achieving much. And this would have protected approximately uh, 25,000 acres of the central Wasatch Range, a pretty, pretty sizable chunk of, of this area that's on, a, uh, on the grand scheme of things. It's a pretty compact landscape. Uh, all the while comes along, you know, the ski industry introduces ski link legislation. So now you have one bill before the United States Congress seeking prote to protect areas. You have another pe bill before Congress to develop, to facilitate uh, development in these areas. And we were on a track that was basically going to decide the fate of the Wasatch via legislative fiat. And so I think what a lot of our leaders uh, said was, this isn't the way to plan for the future of a landscape that's as important as the central Wasatch. Let's, let's form the Mountain Accord. Let's all sit down and see if we can find the middle ground in, in these areas and look at these things. Look at conservation. Look at the future of our ski resorts. Look at the future of trail development. Look at the um, future of recreation up here. Look at the future of what our, um, our policies in place it, in many, many jurisdictions. There are probably 15 or 20 different land use jurisdictions in an area that's less than 200 square miles. It, there, there is a lot of different, we need to be managing this place as a landscape. And that's the opportunity that our organization saw in the Mountain Accord process. 
Um, and I think within the framework that we all signed on to in, um, in August, I think that there's some real opportunity uh, to actually, and, and once again, start looking at the Wasatch Mountains like the landscape they are, instead of the political subdivisions that have been um, dominating the policy and the management of this uh, treasured landscape. So um, that's kind of my piece. Kick it off. If you have questions on some of the specifics, we can absolutely get into that during the Q&A, but I don't want to shortchange the Q&A session. Uh, Nathan. Thanks, Carl, and thanks everybody for uh, attending today. I don't have a ton to add, actually. Um, uh, I will tell you the uh, the ski industry has been uh, a big part of um, Utah for a long time. Brighton, which opens tomorrow, by the way, uh, for their 80th ski season, has been um, uh, had commercial skiing since 1936 uh, at Brighton, and, and the ski industry is a is now over a billion dollar business in the in the state of Utah with. 14 resorts and um, the Mountain Accord has been uh, great for us and a big learning experience for me. You know, we're a, we are a marketing organization, and so I'm not, I still not quite sure where what exactly to call Mountain Accord a process uh, organization. I guess it's all of the above, um, but for us, it's been. Um, uh, we've been doing a lot of listening and a lot of learning, and um, you know. Carl and I have spent more time together over this whole last process. We travel together. We go to Washington, D.C. Um, I think we, you know, one of the things I have learned is that we have more in common than we have differences, I think, between our organizations and between um, the people that come to the Mountain Accord. And while there are times that we seem like we're, um, you know, enemies that couldn't be farther apart, we all end up being recreationists that mostly slide on snow in the mountains right behind us. And uh, so I think there's a lot more in common in there uh, than we think. Um, and as Laney said, um, we just finished up phase one of this Mountain Accord process. Um, while we felt it was pretty difficult and pretty amazing that we got through that phase one, you saw that photo of everybody signing the Accord. The heavy lifting has really yet to begin. You know, we've all kind of gotten to a place where we feel like we're um, we're in the middle. I think we I think everybody agrees that it's it's the right spot to be because nobody left the room high fiving, feeling like they got exactly what they wanted. Everybody gave a little bit, and uh, and that heavy lifting comes in the form of buttoning this thing up and uh, getting legislation passed to make some of these big land trades happen. And, you know, I think there are going to be wins for, for everybody, the ski industry, the backcountry skiing community, the hiking and biking, and you name it. A lot of wins to happen, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of work yet to come. So um, I look forward to the questions as well. And thanks again. they've played a big role in a lot of the concepts that we we talked about today and so plan which says they want to we want to focus our development in a way that facilitates transit and, and growth that's more sustainable in the future um, and they also conducted a wasatch canyons tomorrow plan for the mountains which sort of was a precursor to mountain accord we've partnered with that organization through this process and a lot of what we've designed has been based on the, the valuable work that Envision Utah did. Yeah, I would say, you know, what, what in, we went through the Envision Utah process, Save Our Canyon, I think Ski Utah, a lot of the resorts were all engaged in that, right? And what that was, it, it kind of became a plan. Uh, there were some recommendations in there, but there was no framework to execute a lot of the actions. It was owned by a collaboration. I think it was done by Salt Lake County. I would say what the Mountain Accord is uh, trying to do is to kind of implement the vision or pieces of the vision uh, through this accord process. So 
you know, that's the difference, I would say, from what, uh, there have been a lot of plans. We, what did you say, 80 plans, something like that, that have been conducted in this tiny region over the years? Very few of them had a path towards implementation of those visions, right? So I think that's what we're trying to pull in and incorporate in the accord process. So what we like to say about the accord is that is a, it's a um, it's not a legally binding document but when you have hundreds of members of the public and you have the you know the uh, the highest level of elected leadership that have signed it it's very powerful so its power is in its influence and having you know the public and the stakeholders behind it its power is not in the legal enforceability of it. And I think it's really important that we act on what we agreed to soon, because if it sits around for 20 years and you have change in leadership and then it doesn't, <laughs> we, don't, we don't act. But there's a, there's a strong will to actually execute. You know, each of the parties brought forward a commitment. If all of you do this, I'll do this. And, and each one of those uh, commitments is made by the highest level in the organization. <laughs> And uh, there's a strong commitment to fulfill what's been committed to. Um, I have a question about summer use, um, non-ski use. There's a huge <coughs> increase in that, and it seems that we keep talking about the snow and the ski industry because the hiking industry isn't as lucrative, doesn't bring as tourists in on Delta. But, uh, I hope that that was important, and my question is, was any new wilderness recommended in the accord, any addition to the wilderness that now exists? And my second big concern is about American Fork Canyon. This goes up to the ridge with Utah County. The American Fork is much more pristine, and uh, I know that uh, Snowbird owns land over in there, I think and wants to expand over in there, and what kind of protection will this provide for American Fork? My understanding is none. Um, so I'll, I'll take a crack at two of those, and I'll let Nathan handle Snowbird. <laughs> um, the, uh, so hiking, uh, Save Our Canyons, as the accord was being done, uh, we got together, we actually hired Utah State's University's Outdoor Recreation Department um, because we wanted to make sure all recreation voices were heard in this process. So what we did is we hired uh, Utah State University, partnered with the Forest Service in Salt Lake City, the Watershed uh, Department, and uh, conducted a year-round survey. We interviewed nearly 5,000 uh, recreationists up in the central Wasatch. Uh, for a year. It was uh, entirely, we had two AmeriCorps uh, interns leading that project and then they were coordinating volunteers at over 40 trailheads for an entire calendar year. So we've actually just recently finished those reports and published them, but it gets into not only what they're doing, but what their values are, what's important to people about this place. Um, and so we've compiled that, we've given it to the Accord process as, as part of our, our contribution in, uh, to the Accord process. So those are all on our website. It's under the Central Wasatch, Wasatch Visitors Sur Survey. Um, you can check that out at saveourcanyons.org. Um, and so I, I, I do not think that those values have, have been lost in the process. Second, I want to get into the, uh, the legislative package in the Mountain Accord. So we've been working on um, developing uh, this, this legislative package. And there will be new wilderness areas. Uh, I think the new wilderness area is, is proposed to be the Wayne Owens uh, Mount Air uh, piece on the, uh, between Parley's and Mill Creek Canyon um, above the pipeline trail um, in that area. And then there would be some new wilderness um, at the approach to Lone Peak. 
But the other thing we've actually done, and uh, as the Mountain Accord was, was shaping up, we were looking at the different tools in the toolbox to achieve conservation. And Save Our Canyons has proposed uh, to establish a national monument from Parley's Canyon to Provo Canyon that goes up to the Park City and Wasatch uh, County ridge lines, all the way down to uh, the fronts of the, of the Wasatch Front uh, through Salt Lake and Utah counties. Um, Mountain Accord does not really go into Utah County. We're trying to work uh, with folks over there to achieve that vision. That said, you know, the Mountain Accord has taken that notion of establishing a national monument, although we're not, we're not sure we're going to call it that yet because of some concern around uh, the words. Um, but, um, you know, I think the, the, the idea and the concept behind establishing a broader container to place protections, not just on the wilderness quality, but on the entire landscape, getting back to that landscape vision. And I, and I would add to that that um, this survey that uh, was conducted, and I just, I just reviewed the results of it, it's on uh, Mountain Accord's website, actually had, I can't remember if it was downhill skiing or hiking as the number one use, but they were, you know, very close, first and second as, as uses. And I think if you came and participated in any of the meetings uh, that are open to the public on Mountain Accord, you would see that the focus really is not about the, the ski resorts. I mean, we've got major summer issues and... Um, there's a lot of stakeholders and voices that are that are heard on the accord, and all of that has got to be uh, balanced for the future. We, in fact, we were just meeting with the Park Service to understand how they can help with summer time use. Um, and on on the Utah County side, you know, this is voluntary. You got to keep that. We're, the reason that we're successful is that they're. I didn't more. I didn't force them to come here today. They're here voluntarily, and Utah County has different values and priorities. We can't force them to. We can't force them to, to be a part of a national protections if they, if they don't choose. So um, we're, we'll keep chipping away at that. In the mention about Snowbird, um, and I'm always very careful. I, I, I cannot speak specifically for these individual organizations, but from I'll tell you what I understand. They were at one point exploring the opportunity of um, expanding down into American Fort Canyon on land that was publicly owned. They have since, uh, I believe, and, and I think the land exchange had involved some of this land, but has since um, decided that they weren't going to do that. There is, they still do own some private land in uh, American Fort Canyon, and I, and I don't know the status of it, but I think that they have always thought about um, developing that for skiing, not for hotels, condos, anything like that, but much like Mineral Basin, um, I know they're looking at that one drainage just south of uh, Mineral Basin, the Mary Ellen Gulch area, but, but that's uh, on private land. Um, <clears throat> does the, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, right now one of the issues that just overlays everything is climate change. And uh, as we plan uh, going forward, um, uh, there, there seems to, you know, I think the one thing everybody agrees about with respect to climate action is there's not a sense of urgency now. But uh, um, I think of the governor saying, uh, you know, coal is part of our future in 2030. Uh, but I'm just, I'm wondering um, if that issue of climate, uh, our climate future, um, CO2, is, is an issue that comes up much in the discussions that you're having. I don't know that, I can't say it comes up as much in Mountain Accord. Uh, from our perspective, um, Ski Utah sent, I sent a letter to the governor um, requesting that he, uh, let me say it, requesting, kindly asking that he uh, um, uh, support uh, the administration's clean power plan. We have partnered recently with a company called uh, Protect Our Winners, POW, uh, which is made up of uh, industry, ski industry folks, ski industry athletes. We spent a couple days in Washington, D.C., um, talking to our uh, legislative leadership there. It's something that we're, uh, we're focused on for sure. I mean, and I think we've also talked about within the context of the accord, you know, what are, what are the impacts on the environment from a decreasing, a potentially decreasing snowpack, right? 
Um, you, you have the, the water quality standards today, but if we have less water in those streams and the existing, you know, contaminants flowing into those streams, are we, are we going to exceed or, or have additional degradation on some of our stream corridors in the Wasatch? What does it mean for the future of, I think, industries as well and, and recreational trends and visitation to this area? I mean, I th we, it's, it's a question, though. I don't know that it's been, and we're hoping that through the processes, through some of the NEPA analysis, now that agencies actually have to consider climate change as part of their federal decision-making framework, I think this is actually going to be a really good test um, to, to get some answers and some analysis and have the community engage in that conversation through a NEPA process. Um, I was just curious, in, in your view, <coughs> what would be the largest vessel to let the report part of it, the, the report, what in your view will be the, the biggest federal component, the biggest ask? Preserving the Wasatch. Absolutely. Getting Congress to pass legislation to preserve these areas. That's the only way preservation, meaningful preservation in our minds can take place. I think it's that package of establishment of a national monument, uh, establishment of new wilderness areas, uh, facilitation of some of the land exchanges. They're all joined together at the hip. So I see, we see them as one major federal action. Um, that's that's, that's our, our read and our expectation as a, as a participant in the process, but maybe, maybe Nathan's and Laney's are different. Yeah, and that, you know, what makes that lift easier is that Carl and I are on the same page or we agree upon a package that's on the same page. You know, we went back to D.C. together and he would give his spiel and, and you know, Congressman Chase, Chaffetz would look at me and go, Really? You, you guys on board with this too? And, uh, and we say, yeah, absolutely. Um, we need, you know, we, we've done that hard work in the trenches of, of coming to a common place. Now we need to go collectively to our legislative leadership and say, okay, we've all agreed on this. You guys got to help us out with this now. And uh, if one of us steps out of that, it's not very likely to happen. Wow, a lot of questions. How about that? If I can, so the question is whether or not there's a, like a code of conduct or a, you know, an oath <laughs> that was taken in order to, uh, you know, to ensure that we all fulfill the commitments. And um, I think once you understand the nature of the process, um, I think it'll help you understand better why we don't have that. So first of all, we do have a charter that everybody signed when we started the process, and it's about civil, you know, civic dialogue and and, um, and, and the, the consensus-based process. But for the most part, everybody that has been in, uh, that's participating on the executive board has something that they're giving and something that they're receiving. And the accord has been delicately negotiated such that the thing that each individual is receiving is greater than what they're giving. And so it's, it's uh, th there's no oath because at, at the point which, uh, those that are participating feel like I'm not, I'm getting less than what I'm giving, then they'll, they'll back out. And, and that's like the, the core principle of the whole accord, right? So it's been, it's been delicately negotiated um, in that way. And, uh, and you know, there's some, a lot of details yet to, be, yet to be worked out in the next phase. But they're all still sitting at the table. Everybody's still sitting at the table. We have a full house at our board meetings. So people are highly engaged. And now they're invested. <laughs> like, I've spent two years on this, so I want to see this happen. <laughs> Representative Chaffetz was mentioned 
has uh, this land we're talking about been gerrymandered in some other districts too? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a comment or a question? I'm not sure. Yeah. It falls under uh, Stewart. The urban area, you know, falls under Stewart, I believe, and the the uh, the the mountain area under Chaffetz. But in actuality, we've actually worked with all six of our congressional delegates. Actually, could you be more specific about what the outer limits are? What you are expecting people? How many more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can give a, a, yeah, a very uh, a brief summary of that. So um, the, the limits of the study are, are I-80 down to the southern uh, ridge line of Little Cottonwood and then Park City on the east and the Salt Lake Valley on the west. Um, the, the land that butts up in the mountains, butts up against Salt Lake Valley is actually wilderness. And as you go up, then there's, there's forest service land that's not wilderness. And then most people don't understand this, but as you get into the upper, upper highest peaks, there's actually a lot of private land up there. And then as you move east toward Park City, lots of private land, okay? So what's been proposed in this bucket federal designation is that all the federal land in that area would, be, would fall under the, I just call it the national area because we, we, nobody, none of us can agree what to call it. Um, but it's going to ensure you can do all the same activities you can do today. Um, and so all of that would be included. We're asking Congress to act, and it would actually restrict any further development in that area. Um, the, the land exchanges put about 2,000 acres of land into the public's hands that the four ski resorts own right now, so Snowbird, Alta, Brighton, and Solitude. And in exchange for that, those resorts get some land. Each one of them gets some land at the base, and getting that land does not facilitate development. There's no agreement that they get additional development. However, the process they go through, you know, is different if it's on private land versus federal land, okay? Um, they would get additional snowmaking water from Salt Lake City. And, um, and then the, the amount of development that was already on the books before Mountain Accords started, and we didn't change this, is that at Brighton, or at Solitude, I think there's maybe about 100 or 150 units that were, uh, could be approved. There's water and, you know, some level of approval for that. At Brighton, it's like, I don't know, 50, under 50 units. At Snowbird, it's, it's several thousand, 2,000 units. And at Alta, it was very, very little, third, you know, under 50 units. The only actual development in the Accord that is increased as a result of the Accord is the potential for a 100-unit hotel at Alta. And that has all sorts of conditions wrapped around it. Um, in terms of, of uh, moving people in and out of the mountains, I think that sometimes people perceive that our purpose is just to get more people that's actually not what the accord says. <laughs> what it says is that we want people to be able to enjoy all the activities you can enjoy today. We want to do it, get you up there, and do it in a way that has a smaller footprint on the environment. And so we're just, what we're trying to do is shift from a car-based to a transit-based. And so where those stops are, where the bus stops are, or train stops are, is very important, because that's where the majority of people are going to get off. We've got to figure that out in the next phase. But it's not just, it's not just going from, uh, you know, downtown to the resorts. That's not what it's about. It's about serving all the uses that we all enjoy, all the hiking and all the fly fishing, <laughs> and et cetera. So um, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot more details, and I'm sure other people have a lot more questions. Great. There are a lot more details. <laughs> I've got a question about phasing. I've been worried about sort of the timing because a number of sequential things have to happen over time serve the, the large purpose of the large project. And I kind of wondered, like, what happens if, let's say, we pass a land bill, or, or we do a land, do, you know, even do land exchange that didn't, didn't involve the federal government, even without a land bill. But somehow, some piece gets ahead of the others, and uh, you start seeing, I guess, cherry picking is the word. Some stuff would get done that would serve one party. Other stuff just won't ever quite get done. And I'm kind of worried about the fact that there doesn't seem to be a way to 
fold the whole process together as it develops That it's very good question. And I think each of the stakeholders that signed the accord know about their sequential, you know, that they've thought about the sequence. And so um, maybe there's two that can speak about it. I would just say it's, you know, that makes it even more important to tie those things together. Um, you lose, if you lose all the motivation from one of these groups because one group already got theirs, um, that's a problem. And, uh, you know, trying to keep it tied together is, 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 has been, I'd say, you know, one of Laney's key tasks. Are the, uh, have you been talking to the, the congressional people and uh, representatives in Washington? They've heard you, and they've asked you to nod at them, but have they said, yep, we're on board, we're going to uh, back, back one of these versions of the bill when it comes up on the, on the House floor? Uh, you got to remember the politicians, <laughs> right? They're, 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 uh, um, they have not said, uh, most importantly, they have not said no. Um, they, uh, they will say they want to learn more, um, and, you know, they're noncommittal, but, um, you know, they're listening, which I think is the, is the first step, and um, um, we're staying in close contact with them. Yeah. I wonder what the timing is there is, um, you know, public landfills in Utah, we have a lot of Sure. I think that the, yep. you know, if it doesn't happen, let's say, in two years. You're right. And I think everybody realizes that too, and we have players that are coming and going in this whole process too that have been very motivated uh, that are coming and going, and if we lose that perfect uh, balance of stars aligning for something like this to happen, it's all going to be for naught. But we have put timelines, you know, that say we need to achieve these things prior to the end of 16, 2016. These things are, these are in the accord. You know, the land exchanges, the land conservation, um, those are those are all one part of one package, right? So I think getting that thing done first gets the ball rolling on uh, starting a NEPA process and understanding. But I think and, and understanding that process. But um, that sequencing has been, I would argue, one of the most difficult pieces of this. But I think there's a strong commitment from everybody. To, to try and get some of these, the sequencing that we've identified in the accord going paramount. But there's also other politics that are driving this thing. You know, that we've heard from the Utah delegation, the priority is the public lands initiative, not the mountain accord. So how do we elevate, you know, this on, on um, in, in the scheme in their minds to let them know that this is important. The community has come together. Ski Utah and Save Our Canyons are sitting shoulder to shoulder here talking about a, a, a future and a process to, to secure a future. Um, we need to try and get these, these el the, the issues elevated. You know, it, I wouldn't say ahead of, it would be nice to have it ahead of the PLI or separate from, but um, you know, there, there are many other lands issues in the state that are dominating the discussion. Salt Lake City waters. Most of the water involved belonged to Salt Lake City initially. I know that I live in Sandy, and they they have 20% of Little Cotton Creek that's diverted just to the residents, you know, for their mm -hmm. irrigation and so on. And it's a fight. It's a constant fight. They do these developments, and, and they try to sneak things in and don't, and don't do the things that the way they're supposed to. But I didn't know that all the water was basically controlled by Salt Lake City. Uh, another point I have is like, I can see what we're talking about sort of is like Mill Creek is now a city. So they're going to have a different perspective of what their accord is now too. And then one more point I wanted to make is how is this thing with scaling going? Is that a done deal? I mean, is that a thing of the past or is it, are we still fighting? Let me clarify that, and that is, those are my two least favorite words to hear probably is ski link. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before you get too excited, uh, <laughs> um, that so, and just to differentiate a little bit, Ski Link um, was a concept that was brought, uh, brought up and, uh, in my view, really poorly thought out um, way to connect one private resort with another private resort. It didn't, uh, it did not, as the one Wasatch concept that Ski Utah and our other resorts have brought forward, um, uh, and it was across uh public land too um so 
they're very different concepts. One Wasatch concept is very much still alive, um, and it's very uh, um, sought after by the ski resorts. It's not over public land, it's over private land. Um, there are lots of things that have to fall in place for something like that to happen. It's totally in, ingrained in the Mountain Accord uh, process. Um, um, but there's, it's often gets confused between Ski Link, One Wasatch, Mountain Accord. I mean, uh, it's understandable why people get confused with that process. But the company that came up with that Ski Link concept is no longer, uh, doesn't own the canyons anymore. And, and I, you know, I think they did, personally, I think they did uh, a fair amount of damage to the name and credibility of the ski industry, the way they went about trying to make that happen with kind of a backhanded legislative runaround. Um, hasn't made my job any easier uh, selling what we think is a much less invasive uh, concept. Speaking of the private land in the canyons, not all of it is owned by the ski areas. In particular, I'm thinking of two separate areas. The Albion Basin, there is some land that is privately owned that has been the subject of much litigation attempting to get um, water rights for lots that were platted back in the 60s and have never been built on. Um, and I wonder what the status is of that in terms of trying to buy those people out. And the other area that I'm wondering about is in Big Conwood Canyon, across from Solitude in the Willow Heights area, there's a trail up to Willow Lake and the little plaque that says it's owned by the United Park City Mines Corporation that land is. So how much private land is over there and what are the plans if any to buy that out and then Elbian Basin? Well, we had a pretty significant effort in the last phase to identify those key private parcels. And uh, there are mechanisms already today in place uh, to put those into into public hands where there's a willing seller. And so Salt Lake City has a program, Salt Lake County has a program, Utah Open Lands, the Forest Service. Prices have always been far below what those people want. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's issues. We haven't been that successful. There, probably I would say about 20% of the land up in the canyons is actually privately held. So we, uh, absolutely incredibly important, we have some of those landowners that have come forward that are trying to actually do the right thing. And uh, we just weren't successful in the first phase. We bit off a lot. <laughs> we're trying to solve a lot of problems. And so we're really committed to trying to put together a program and negotiate with those landowners and try to um, make that more uh, easier per to participate and, uh, and figure out a way to negotiate a, a solution that um, not only makes the private landowner happy and gets the key parcels into public land, but also does it in a way that's justifiable for a public expense, right? So it's got to be something on the books that shows, you know, we, we use taxpayer money, so we can't pay higher than market rates, right? And so um, it's, it's something we're committed to in the next phase. I think that, you know, there are two, there are two, the two most significant tools to managing and kind of controlling private land development is one, the acquisition program, which I think we do need to coordinate and get that up and running, but the second is zoning. And, and, you know, what we've found through our research, what we've seen over the years as people are asked over and over again, you know, how much development should be happen in these canyons and in these environments, it's in the 90th percentile of people that are saying no more development up there. And so I think we need to get our zoning regulations on par with the sentiment of the community. And I would say the biggest hurdle to achieving that it's not the folks at the county, but it's the folks in the state legislature that have not enabled the tools for us to implement zoning regulations that protect our environment. So, I mean, I think that's going to be a huge, huge task, whether the accord, you know, rolls that in. You know, it's, it kind of falls under some of the governance stuff that we're talking about within the accord process. Heard talk that there was talk of what? Oh. Let me pull up a map. 
Somebody want to take this, or y'all want me to? You got it. You're up there. Okay. <laughs> sure, let me take the tunnel. Um, so the, the thing that has been agreed to by all the stakeholders is that we want to move people um, via transit and that we are ready to start. Uh, we want to create a system where it's uh, the incentive is to take transit and the disincentive is to take your car. So that's kind of as much as we've agreed to right now, okay? Um, the Accord does outline that we want to study the uh, lots of options for doing that, basically focused on buses and potentially trains. Um, the focus, at least in the Cottonwood Canyons, is not on aerial solutions, and basically there's technical reasons for them to travel times that are very slow. Um, so when Nathan mentioned the one Wasatch concept of connecting the resorts, this came up through the public process. You know, like, are we ever going to connect Little Cottonwood and Big Cottonwood? Or are we ever going to connect Big Cottonwood and Park City? And uh, there's, of, of course, people fall on all sorts of different sides of that, <laughs> you know, opinion. But what we did say is it's probably time to answer this question so that it doesn't keep coming up every 20 years. So the ski resorts have put forward uh, the proposal of connecting the ski lifts. But what we what came up through the accord is the notion that we want to move people on mass transit, and we want people to be able to use transit year round, shoulder seasons, summer, wheelchair accessible, uh, workers, employees, locals, tourists, and that uh, buses and trains offer a different. Uh, way of doing that than, than aerial solutions and ski lifts. So we want to study, that's about as far as we got, we want to study that in the next phase. It's just a concept. And the ski resorts have come forward to say, you know, if we connect via a tunnel and mass transit, that could be a replacement model for the ski lift connection. And, uh, but that's a big public dialogue that we've got to have, and we're going to be having that in the next phase. So we have a lot of hard, hard discussions coming forward. Many times, yes. Okay, I haven't seen that, but you know, our legislature doesn't seem to take much uh, uh, value in the public opinion or the public vote. How often will you have on each of the issues that you have? Do you, uh, do you set a pattern? Are you going to have public opinion for all decisions or just big decisions? Or uh, you know, we uh, and each of you has a role to play here in this in this important topic that you've brought up. We. Uh, we want to hear from the public. All of our meetings are open to the public for attendance, and all of our decisions are open for public feedback on the website. That's how we conducted it in the last phase. The problem is, is that you can only get 2% of the public to actually go to your website and submit a comment. So in the, it's, it's really about getting public awareness and, and having driving more people to our website so that we get more. Are you doing feedback. some marketing ideas to get the word out Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to be ramping up our marketing efforts in the next phase. send somebody from Park City to Alta real quickly, I don't think you need that for marketing purposes. You've got a good start here, quit grabbing it. If I could uh, just chime in here, I, we would like to keep our dialogue civil, and that is a, a, a tenant of the... <laughs> uh, just a defend, just uh, to defend Nathan here a bit, it, you know, in the accord, I'll repeat this again. We, op we opened up our process to over 200 people that care the most about the mountains. 
And uh, we asked him, you know, what is your ideal scenario in the future? And there's a lot of stakeholders that came through in that process, not the ski resorts, that said, we'd like to look at the notion of connecting these canyons, okay? So this isn't, this isn't a ski resort notion. It has been brought forward for 100 years by all sorts of people, legislators, you name it. This is a concept that's been around for a long time. And, and you know, we're here to answer the question in a public way. We're here to, to invite the public to help answering that question. It's a 100-year-old concept. Why are you still kicking the family life? Really? I, I, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, I, th uh, um, I appreciate the, the comment and the question. Um, as passionate as you are against it, I think there are an, uh, at least an equal amount of people who are passionate for it. Um, one. What's that? I'm one. No, absolutely. There's an equal number that are passionate for it. Yeah. I'll grant you that. Yeah. So what? Um, <laughs> what I will say is uh, it's, it's hard to understate or overstate uh, the uh, opportunity for Utah's ski industry with a concept like that. Well, he's going to double to two billion and then be a tiny drop in our budget. Come on, let's be. You know, we're in the ski Utah is in the the more people business, and we are our goal is to market the state ski industry. We think a concept like that would be um, an un unbelievable tool to market and unbelie unbelievably fun experience to ski too. Let's go back here. And I, you know what, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about that are person. There, in, in your studies, in the report, are there women that looked at what, that was kind of my earlier question. And you said, this is how many people we can support. <laughs> These are how many people can hike the mountains. Because I think there's a lot of us older hikers here who know that it's, most, you know, so many more people are using and enjoying the mountains summer and winter. There's got to be a limit. Is that addressed by the court? You know, we don't have all those, uh, we don't have specific numbers for how many people uh, constitute an impact on uh, the environment or the watershed or how many people constitute a, a poor experience. And so we're actually partnering um, with a couple of institutions to answer that question in the next phase. And I think the, the question is not when is it too many and then put the gate up. The question is, is there a way to accommodate the demand and put, you know, uh, high numbers of people in certain areas where they can be accommodated with pavement and restrooms and then maintain wilderness areas in other areas so that you still have a diverse and range of experiences. This is incredibly an important issue. It drives our transportation solutions and, uh, and we're committed to, to looking at that in the next phase. Yeah, I think for for decades we've been advocating for you know land managers to do carrying capacity analysis on on this area and i i, I would i reluctantly say you know they've said yes ish to doing that but you know the question is always thrown back at us you know what is what does carrying capacity mean what are we measuring capacity for are we measuring it for opportunities for solitude on on public lands are we you know managing it for water quality are we managing it for wildlife uh you know what what capacity and i think the answer is yes right it needs to be a weighted and tiered carrying capacity analysis and i think we'll they're going to dig into that a little bit more in the second phase which i think you know it's that's the people have been asking for that for a very long time and we're finally going to get some idea to that answer hopefully not too late did you get your uh, well, I was going to comment too. Um, are there any like short term plans for transportation? Uh, I was looking at something and like 57% of the emissions here are from private vehicle operation. And to like comment on turning everything into mass transit isn't necessarily to make more money, but to keep our city and our communities healthier is like that's like something that needs to be addressed. Like, ASAP and, uh, you know, we don't have that much time. I'm just wondering if there's anything that can happen now. We're working on that. And uh, 
hopefully uh, when we do our official launch on phase two, we'll have something important to say, meaningful to say about that. Uh, I don't have consensus yet, and I represent consensus positions, and so hopefully we'll have a consensus on making that a priority, and we have some specific ideas. This relates to transportation as well. You said you're mostly looking at buses and trains. And are trains feasible for Little and Big Cottonwood Canyons? Has that been looked at yet, or is that more part of phase two? You know, there's just been some high-level feasibility study that's, uh, that we've looked at. They are feasible in mountain environments. There's cog rail technology that is, uh, you know, it's like light rail technology and it engages a cog and it can go up grades that are very steep. So uh, it's kind of low, low impact, I would say. So it is feasible. The little cottonwood uh, has a more pressing need or would benefit more because of the avalanche paths and uh, the, the traffic levels. It's also a little bit straighter Whereas Big Cottonwood has some curves, the, the natural canyon has some curves that uh, would, would imply you know, higher levels of impacts. And that's about all we know today. So we want to dig into that in the next phase. <clears throat> Let me, uh, first of all, uh, thank all of you for being here uh, and for your interest uh, in the topic. Remind you of uh, upcoming uh, Stegner Center events that I mentioned, uh, available, information available on the website. Uh, and uh, most of you, I hope, are on our email list. Um, and uh, please join me in thanking uh, Carl, Nathan, and Laney for spending the time with us and sharing. <laughs> uh, I think they can stick around perhaps for a couple minutes if sure. <clears throat> folks have individual questions. Thanks again for coming. Uh,